Hello and welcome to another episode of Enter the Boardroom with New Roll, the business-oriented podcast that brings the boardroom to your channel of choice. I'm your host, Oliver Cummings, CEO of New Roll, the board-level hiring platform that specializes in the high-value placements that drive high-impact boards. Today, I'm with American businessman, serial entrepreneur, technology expert, and former President Obama appointee, Eric Collins. Eric's an American board investor and board advisor who's now making waves in the UK's tech industry. Eric lives and breathes entrepreneurship with a recent focus on using his decades of expertise to help underrepresented demographics build and grow their businesses. He's CEO at Impact X Capital Partners. He's brought his business acumen to Channel 4 with his recent investment series, The Moneymaker, which is my new favorite show. And his new book titled We Don't Need Permission releases later this year. Eric, welcome and thank you so much for being on the show today. Oliver, thank you for having me. You and my family, immediate family, might be the only fans of, you know, The Moneymaker. So I'm glad to see that you're actually watching it. Um, well, I'd love to talk more about that because actually I, I was was originally skeptical when I sort of heard heard about it. I thought, oh gosh, here we go, another another Dragon's Den where these poor contestants have it sort of ripped out of them, and there's no real sort of value. And and actually, what I loved about it is how the way it's such a sort of positive story, and you're really helping them, you're teaching them, confronting them, but you're really adding value as well. And it, and it just appears before your eyes. But I'd I'd love to talk about that more in a, in a moment. But I'd love to start first of all with just hearing more about your story, because it's an amazing one. Um, you've been a successful exec in large tech companies. You've worked with government. You're now an investor and media mogul. What what have been the sort of guiding lights and secret sauce for you? Hmm, it's an interesting question, Oliver. And I believe that the answer is something which is a little bit cliche. It's saying yes to risky opportunities. That's That's been, I think, across all of the pieces of my background that you've talked about, it's actually having to make an affirmative decision that maybe the way that people would expect me to go is not the way that I have to go. And that with other people who have unexpected and disruptive approaches to utilizing and leveraging my skills when they come around and ask me, will you today do such and such? Maybe the answer should be more often yes than no. Certainly there's some questions that you ask, But you really should say yes. I have to think about, you know, coming out of the United States to come to the UK. As as you and I both know, that Silicon Valley is a very unique investment um, ecosystem. I was on the East Coast of the United States. I was in Boston. I was in Washington, D.C., both that have very developed ecosystems. But then to come across the pond and to come to the UK and to say that I could actually establish some opportunity here also. That was you know, saying yes to something that I had not considered before. When I went to a health tech company after the first company I came to work with sold, you know, going into a digital health company that's really thinking about the gamification of the education of surgeons and trying to solve the problem of how you get 5.5 billion people who don't have access to safe surgery, how do you get them safe surgery? And then there's this idea that you have an app that's a game and that that will actually help surgeons to get better to the gold standard. And then that is going to be used to actually drive robotic surgery, saying yes to that. It's like, okay, let's say yes to that. And starting this company, um, Impact X, and I'm a part of now, saying yes to some of the boards that I participate in. It's it's all about trying to figure out things that might disrupt my own plans and that would actually have outsized potential for returns. And in that way, I sound like any venture capitalist, not just looking at the companies that are in my portfolio, but looking at my, my own portfolio of opportunity that then comprises my life. So. Yes, I think I like that. Okay, that's great. And I always find like I learn most from where what what I've what I've got wrong. Um, when you look back at that 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 sort of journey, where are the moments where that has gone wrong for you, so to speak? And, and what have you learned from those moments? Oh, the number of times that I've been walked out of organizations because I've either overstayed my welcome uh, or that uh, the skills that I have are no longer necessary. So either I make the decision or the organization makes the decision for me that we no longer have, there's no longer a love match. Uh, Though I think those are very important. Um, Those are very important points. I had one back in um, 2000, 2010. In 2010, I was working in an organization called uh, Nuance. Nuance Communications, people might know because they recently sold to Microsoft for about $19 billion. This is an organization that over the course of about 20 years had been had really consolidated the input and output elements of mobile devices and really beyond mobile devices, cars, 
and then also things that were used in healthcare. This is an organization that said that if we focus on input technology, text input technology, voice input technology, instructions that are given um, by voice and then help to control things, if we, in, if we control input, we can then also control a whole, and we can participate in a whole series of transactions, whether they be on the telephone, whether they be on, uh, whether they be on computers, whether they be on tablets, whether they be on handsets. And that for me was a fascinating organization. The person in charge of that organization had very big plans. Um, and this guy had helped to build that organization. He was, it was an organization that preexisted him, but he's really the founder of the, the really great organization that Nuance became and a very valuable one. And I went to work for him when we were acquired. I had been, I'd been um, heading up a division for Time Warner, uh, you know, the big media conglomerate. And this was a software company that was a wholly owned subsidiary, and we got purchased. The thing, I, the thing that happened from the very beginning is that there was a difference in culture and a difference in values. And I allowed that to cloud my thinking from the very beginning. Everyone who I met who questioned my values or questioned the culture that I was bringing with my company, which is called TGIC, the T9 software, very famous software, those people became enemies. Not that they became people who might have something to tell me and that maybe I should think differently, but they actually went right into the enemy camp. And then those became people with whom I had to um, tussle, as opposed to people from whom, with whom by sort of harnessing some of their thinking, harnessing their concerns, and maybe rethinking some of what I was doing, uh, that we might be able to get to a better place, that A, that, you know, a plus B would equal you know, Z prime, or that one plus one would equal 17. Didn't really have that mindset. And I think that's because I also was extremely focused on my baby. That organization, TGIC and T9, even though I hadn't started the company, that was my baby. The team that had built that company to be so interesting that it actually was then purchased by another organization. I had actually constructed what that organization was. And then having that turn over to someone else, I wasn't prepared to turn over my baby. And so a number of things happened. So I think that would be an example of and the learnings that I had from that situation. I've tried not to duplicate those. Sometimes what happens, because I've then been, I've had four companies that I have um, that I have been part of that have sold to public American companies. And what I've learned is to, is to understand that I am a custodian for those organizations for as long as I am a custodian for those organizations. When someone else decides that they have a custodianship and that can, they can bring a custodianship that looks a little bit different, I need to understand, negotiate that, you know, I might need to turn over my, my child to someone else who can do things with my child that I never envisioned. Uh, the same sort of disruptive piece that I said that I talked about before, I should say yes and sort of lean into saying yes. And so that's one of the things. That's an example of something that hadn't gone well and what I've learned from there. Okay, really interesting. And and that makes so much sense to me because one of the things that really jumped out at me watching you on um, Moneymaker was your sensitivity to the entrepreneurs. You really understood and seemed to relate to their problems, which you know we see so many investor directors failing to do that. We talk to lots of founders really struggling with their investor directors who often are these very smart people, but they've never run a business. They've seen lots of playbooks before, and so they can tell you what it should be, but they don't fundamentally relate to it. And, and I, I relate to that a little bit, having been an investor myself in a, in a previous life where I used to spend you know, 80% of my time focused on the numbers and 20% of my time focused on the other stuff. Now, you know, trying to build a business, I spend 80% of my time focused on the, the people, and I know that the numbers will take care of themselves if I get that right. And and, and watching you in, in that series actually was just, it was amazing. As uh, I watched each of... Um, them as as you kind of were like a textbook of everything I think a great board member should be the way you were sort of creating opportunities for them helping them refine their processes uh, I mean it was you know uh, getting that interview for um, uh, the, the Primo team with Charlie Mullins at, at Pimlico Plumbers you know Sussex Bread Bakery getting them into Bread Ahead um, for Winnie's introducing them with Pip and Nut and Trim It getting them into Uber I mean it was just like wow I mean every every organization needs an Eric helping them with stuff like that but it wasn't just like that it was you were helping them with the focus you're helping them connect with with kind of the right digital people to explode their growth you were helping making sure they were getting their unit economics right I mean there was just so it was so rich and and I sort of feel like I'm now going to be telling anyone who wants to understand what a great board member should do just go watch those um, sort of episodes what's how do you think about it um you know what's your playbook I'm guessing you've got a sort of structure to the way you go about it um and and I'd love to hear more about that 
So, Oliver, you, you, you've hit on a number of interesting points, and I'm, I'm really flattered that you that you've paid that much attention. I mean, that's fantastic. I do hope that there are some explicit things that come through, and, you know, their graphics and other sorts of things, which are really meant to be teachable moments in those episodes. And you can see, anyone who wants to see The Money Maker can see it on the all four catch-up service on for Channel 4. So it's it's there. The the but beyond that, I wanted to sort of, I need to model sort of how I behave with organizations as a board member and as an investor. And the, the purpose, I believe, of a good board member is to not take over the organization, but to try and understand, you know, this is an extraordinary individual or an extraordinary team that's in front of you. They have gone from the inertia of just thinking of something to actually producing something. And they've produced something that's so interesting and valuable that it actually Get, catches my attention. And from there, the question is, how can I assist in making this third thing, which is the company itself, as effective as possible? And for me, it is also extremely important because I'm not going to be an executive board member, but a non-executive board member, that I've got to really be very clear that Anything that I suggest is going to be implemented by someone else. Any introduction I make is going to be followed through by someone else. Anything that I tr that I transform in terms of strategy and the like is something that is going to be someone else's responsibility and primarily their responsibility. So I need to make sure my first thing is that I spend time with those entrepreneurs understanding what kind of entrepreneur they are. Because not all entrepreneurs are the same, right? They're, they're those entrepreneurs who are just workhorses. They are ready to toil and toil and toil until they, and you know, they even fall down and they continue, you know, sliding through the mud to try and make it work. There are others that, and there's some that can take a lot of criticism, like being screamed at by a coach on the pitch. There are those who need a, um, a bit of empathy first. There's some that are looking for, who have much more experience than I do, and are not looking for me to tell them what's wrong, but to help to, um, you know, lean into tailwinds as opposed to helping them to undo headwinds. So the first thing that I think of for me as a, as a board member is to observe and to listen a little bit. And when I say observe, it's not just observe to just sit around, but to actually look to see how the organization functions. How does the leadership function with the team? How does the leadership function among themselves? How does decision making really get made as opposed to what they tell me? And then to utilize that at, to tell, let me determine what are the key elements that I should then focus on if indeed I believe that something needs to change, be tweaked, you know, wholesale, you know, gotten rid of? How might the best way to actually get that done in the most efficient fashion and not for me to become part of the problem or the, or the um, you know, management team or the founding team become part of the problem? but indeed leverage them for the solution. I think that's, that's something that you learn over time though. You don't necessarily get that because I think the first time you're a board member, especially if you're on a paid board, there's such anxiety that you are really accomplishing what you need to accomplish and that you're, you're proving yourself effective. And so the enthusiasm that you might throw around and all of the, um, and all of the chaos that might flow from that is not necessarily the most productive use of time. And the other thing I've got to remember, and I go back to something I said earlier, I'm not going to be there every day. And I've got to leave organization in, in space that they can actually function and still be available for, I'll still be available, but they can function on their own because I, again, I'm not going into these organizations to, um, to be there on a, on a minute by minute basis, monitoring all of these sorts of things. I really do want to be a board member. I've been a, a, um, executive and I'm an executive in my own company and I understand what that as an operating executive looks like and I'm interested in something very different when I'm a board member and I want to make sure that those two things remain a non-executive board member in particular and I want to make sure those things stay very separate so I'm pretty I'm pretty systematic in my approach but it always starts with listening and always starts with observing that resonates a lot I mean that's something I'm always guilty of is you know I can see all the things that are sort of wrong quote unquote uh, in a business and I sort of start pointing them all out and of course you just overwhelm the executive team when you do that as a board member and all the great board members that I've worked with um, certainly as, as an investor and with our own business um, uh, are doing exactly what you're doing that they, they figure out what are the one or two really key things and they overlook the other the other sort of less important things so that, so that you really move the needle. But I also want to make sure that it's clear that we're talking about substance versus process. 
So substance is what is the right answer. Process is how we get to the right answer. I'm going to focus first on process. Process is the thing which, if leveraged appropriately, can then help with any substantive issue. And so that's why I start with listening. That's why I start with observing. And I start really on decision making and how we get, how the team actually executes. Mm -hmm. That then is something that can affect and impact all the substance. That's what I'm looking at. So I'm constantly starting on process. Then I get to substance. Got it. But what, what was also clear to me from sort of watching you at work in those things, and it was just fascinating. It was the first and probably only time I'll ever get to sort of see a, a board member like that other than the boards that I sit on, was that, though you say you're not going to be there every day you've you've clearly built relationships with the different teams mm -hmm. and you were clearly there at the critical junctures because sometimes what we see are board members you know often it'll be the great and the good who you know have all these amazing blue chip names on their cv success stories and they don't actually have time to commit and engage and add value but what was really clear to me there is you were really doing that you were really adding value and it was just so palpable to see how do you how do you think about the sort of the time that you're dedicating to each of these opportunities i, I sort of think about a procedural agreement it's called it's almost like we are going to have to decide up front what our what needs the organization has it's sort of like it's sort of like raising children um, or raising a family that you've got to there you know we're going to go to work we're going to um, see our other friends we're going to have to have some internal life and the idea of what are we going to do in order to still then maintain the healthy balance that's associated with raising the children to be all that they can be that's kind of the same uh, type of conversation that has to happen in a very explicit and adult fashion, I think, early on. I don't make those decisions in isolation. You want to have canaries in the coal mine that tell you that something's happening, that something's going, that something's going on. Your system, your servers are having problems processing. So you're probably going to have an outage. There's legislation that's going to come up in this other country and that's likely going to impact you negatively. So some of these canaries that will let you know that there's something toxic that might be in front of you and let's then plan this. Procedural contracts and procedural agreements with the founders and uh, the executives in a team and also the other board members help me to then be able to allocate the right kind of time. It's not going to be an infinite amount of time, but the right time and the most strategic, because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to move from the things which are less strategic and let and sort of more um, mundane to the things which have the higher impact. The I want to be able to sort of do the repair with one you know, turn of the screw, as opposed to having to take apart the entire engine in order to figure out what goes on. And so part of that in terms of communication, part of that in terms of early um, understanding what the problem is, will all be part of the process of being able to go forward most efficiently. And for me, it's all about efficiency. I have never met, I have never met a founder. I've never met an executive who wants more of my time than I want to give them because they all have lots and lots to do. No one is that interested in dinners at my house or at my club. No one is interested in my jokes over you know, lunch. No one cares that much. They really want to have an efficient approach to getting solutions so they can move to the next level. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was remarkable watching, mm -hmm. uh, I was particularly struck on the, in that first one, and I suppose I was coming at it cold watching Primo, and I saw you going to this business, and I thought, mm, wh wh why is he spending time with this business? This looks like a real sort of tiny little business. And then just the way you forensically started dissecting it, and, and I think actually Jason talked about it like that, he felt like he'd been cut apart and then put back together. And then once, once you sort of identified that nugget within the business the 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 invisible repairs and then you'd opened it up to that distribution channel of suddenly you know talking to 15,000 you know potential clients through the housing associations it, it was just extraordinary to see it un unveiling like that and one thing I'm interested in because lots of board members will talk about how they can do that they can add value through their networks now but what was so clear in that, and, you know, that was one example, but you did it with, you know, across a range of things in those series, you know, jellyfish on the digitization uh, front. And it was just, it's that ability to come in and say, these are really good people who are really going to help you unlock your particular problem. How have you managed to sort of build that network, especially coming over from the US? And I know you've been in the UK a while now as a sort of through your exec career, but how have you managed to build those sorts of networks and, and maintain them as well? Let's have a conversation about that someday, Oliver. The fully plural board member who is far away from the operational um, and the mundane elements of operational um, excellence within an organization. I, I'm like 
you're, you're preaching to the choir with that one. I do believe there's so many people who have a, you know, 30,000 foot view of things. And it's like, boy, I get it. And I get how that sounds really great, but let's, let's bring it down to sort of what is actionable and executable. So what I, what I find um, in particular that happens um, in organizations for me is that I've got to make a decision how much of my network because I have the, the network that I've been building over time here in the UK is hard one network. It comes from a lot of mistakes, hiring the wrong people, the wrong consultants, the wrong sort of employees and bringing and time and time again, uh, sort of having to go through a churn process, bring them in, have them do something small, goes horribly wrong, find someone who's better, get another referral, keep on going. So what I do, once I find something that works and someone who is actually very good, they go not, they could don't, they don't just go into my, you know, sort of Rolodex, an old term, but they actually go into a database that I'm going to continue to hit that data, that, that piece of data time and time again. I'm only going to make them available though, if I believe that the organization is going to utilize them and that they're going to fully use and maximize and optimize the use. And part of my challenge in the money maker was, I think there's one business in particular, and I know, I'm sure you know who I'm talking about, that you know, we, we put in front of that person tens of thousands of pounds worth of consulting services that, are, that were transformative, absolutely transformative. And the entrepreneur just could not see the benefit for whatever reason. That is a waste of time for not only the entrepreneur, but then also for my connection. And my connection then ask the question it's like why would you put us into a situation where we can't actually shine where we can't actually do anything we want to be helpful also we want to we want to succeed and have other organizations succeed so you put us in a poor position and so you know having over time built that relationship having met that organization having worked with them successfully before it is problematic for me to then put them in a place where they can be successful and have at least a reference account from this particular from this particular engagement and I don't just throw them out and say, here's an email that says, here, so, you know, such and such, meet such and such. I think you'll be, I think you'll under, you'll, you'll like to talk to each other with no context. I make phone calls ahead of time. I set up exactly what I want to have happen. I'll probably attend the first meeting and then from there and decide what the next steps are going to be, the, de the definitive next steps, and then let people go from there. I think that this referral opportunity is miss, is, is also miss, um, utilize. I think often people throw things over the garden wall and then walk away. And I believe that that's actually the wrong way to get the best outcome. So I have to spend time. And therefore, if I'm going to do that, I'm expecting it as a risk mitigation. I'm using it as a risk mitigation strategy. I believe that I'm going to be able to get higher returns with less problem and less sort of um, what I had in one of those episodes, people just sort of not being able to fully leverage if indeed I stay a little bit more involved. Therefore, it's going to be more efficient and more effective. One of the things that jumped out at me in, in that conversation was how you handled some of those awkward conversations and, and walk that line that I, I suppose a board member often has to do between both being a sort of coach and supportive and helping the, the executive, but also confronting awkward and, and difficult truths. And as one person recently sort of put it to me, you know, disagreeing agreeably. And, and you seem to sort of do that just masterfully. How do you think about that? What's going through your head when you're having those conversations? What are the, the frameworks or, or tools that you're um, leaning on? Oliver, it's a great question. In the back of my head are two things. I grew up as a middle child. <laughs> I have an older brother and a younger sister, and so that was my first approach to trying to, you know, if you if you do things too disagreeably, your little sister hits you, and <laughs> everything goes haywire, you know, because there was that outside arbiter called mom and dad. So I learned early on. I mean, I have to take these things from somewhere. It's it's sort of ingrained <laughs> from positive. It's like Pavlovian positive and negative responses that you know, if ind indeed this happens, and I'm not able to resolve this on my own. And I have a person who is not then motivated to move forward with me and someone who is probably going to sort of veer off the path that we agreed to. That is not a good outcome and it's likely to lead to the punishment. I can't watch TV. I can't play video games. I can't do any of those sorts of things. So that started early on. There's another person who came into my life when I went to law school. So I went to law school. Um, and in the United States, you go to undergraduate, you do your undergraduate work, and then you do your law degree. So four years and then three years. And at my law school, there was a course that was taught by a, one of the greats of negotiation theory and practice. His name is Roger Fisher. He wrote a book called Getting to Yes. 
he and the people in the Harvard Negotiation Project just became my mentor. And that was actually one of the reasons why I actually stayed in law school because I, I because my first day of law school, this is a little secret between you and whoever's listening. I decided in my first class, the first hour, I decided I made the biggest mistake of my life when I sat down in that first class, which was a contracts class, because I said, this is, this is horrible and an antiquated approach to learning. And I have to do this for three years. This could, this could be the death of us all, you know, not just me, but you know, everyone else too. So um, I found though a class that was being taught by Roger Fisher in conflict resolution. And this class was based, it was a negotiation workshop. It's called the negotiation workshop, but it was really conflict resolution. And this class, one of the major elements is lots of life is about persuading people to do something differently. And there are only two ways that this happens. The only way that things end on one side or the other is if indeed the interests are satisfied or the alternatives are so bad that indeed people have to make their own decision. And again, because their interests will only be satisfied if they make a different decision, but it's all about persuasion. And then the secondary piece is that indeed, if you want to get people persuaded, you've got to figure out how to do this. And generally persuasion is not going to happen by lecturing people, telling them they're stupid, not understanding what's, what's going on with them and not empathizing. The, the things which allow you to be able to change a person's mind or to be able to understand, oh, if that's how you're thinking, this might be a solution to the problem that would actually address all of your needs. So when I said early on that I listened first in terms of in times of conflict, in terms of in times of bad things, I listened first. But then I also realized that, you know, quite frankly, we can talk forever. I can make you try and feel good about some solution. And sometimes those difficult solutions just have to be made. Some people have to be fired. Sometimes things we have to go in a different direction than you had otherwise thought. Sometimes we have to say that that use of capital was a bad use of capital. There's no, it, we can talk about it in objective terms, though. The reason it's a bad use of capital is for this. It's not that you're a bad person. It's not that you're stupid. It's not that you are that you have no sort of sense and that you shouldn't be running this organization. But at that particular point, this wasn't so good. What did we learn from this and what can we do going forward? Those are things which I think almost everyone can buy into. So when I'm on, I'm working on the money maker and I'm working with these organizations and these organizations rarely work with a person like me. They rarely work with a person who has my sort of background. Um, and who generally doesn't invest in companies of those scale and that really have started off as lifestyle firms and are coming to something else. These organizations have a special set of entrepreneurs, you know, salt of the earth, people who are like most entrepreneurs in the UK, small and medium size, and never have outside consultants, never have Uber coming on board, never have Morrison's that you can actually, um, you can actually pitch to, never have jellyfish as part of who is going to come to your rescue. So indeed, understanding that we're bringing something new to the equation is also part of the empathetic approach and allows me to do more listening and then construction of solutions that make sense. What, what, what do you think holds so many of those sort of SME organizations back from understanding that? I believe it's the same thing that holds us all back from making change in our lives. Most of the time, we're muddling through. And often we muddle through and get to a, so, a get to some sort of a resolution that you know the, the the pain is addressed. We you know have you know cut ourselves and we do something and it stops and the pain stops. We don't get a further on infection and we you know continue on. And we were learn we learn to take our own counsel. We learn over time because so many of us have wasted time and and money with people who swear that they can help us. But then the, the, what they bring to the table doesn't actually address the concern. And you've had these situations, I'm sure. People come to you and say, this is what I can do. You, we talk about this with board members. Board members will constantly say to you, this is what I can bring. And it never appears. But you've given them some equity. You've had them at the table for some period of time until you finally realize that something's gone wrong. So most of us are a little bit... Um, in, well, I'm from the American South, and so I'm going to use this terminology. and It's not the best thing. But some of us are very trigger shy. We do not believe that we should just engage the first time we hear something from someone. We have a high level of skepticism. We don't have a process to test that skepticism, to see whether or not in this particular situation, we should take a different conclusion than we did in some other situation where it was correct. I think that's where the problem is. And so organizations, including me, and, and I'm founders of organizations, including mine, when someone comes in and it all seems too good to be true, we generally are skeptical. And then if it keeps on, we keep on going and, and still nothing bad has happened, we still remain some, re retain some skepticism. And again, we don't have a method that we've evolved in order to check that out, whether it be 
thinking through a series of reference checking, which we would do for employees, but we don't necessarily do in terms of advisors and board members in the same way, or the kinds of questions that we ask are not the questions which are going to get to our real concerns. Will this person put their shoulder to the wheel and help me to make this organization the organization I wanted? What is this person really like as a board member on a day-to-day -day basis? Are they operational? Are they executive? Or do they like a retreat? You know, what are they, what have you seen in terms of them? We don't ask people because they have Lord this and they have CBE that after their name, that those are things that are impolite to ask. And quite frankly, we'd ask of any employee from the, you know, programmer straight through to the, the sales team or the CFO, you know, what they, what their credentials are, but we don't do that same type of reference checking and the like, and that hard questioning around what is the actual tangible value that we're achieving. So in my perception, it's both, you know, we don't have good strategies for how do we actually interrogate concerns, and then we don't have good sort of approaches. We don't, we don't take the same approaches that we use in order to say that this is the right person. I mean, we do more for this is the kind of person that we date versus this is the kind of person that we bring into our organization. That resonates so much, actually. You know, that's something we've, we've gone through, that learning around, you know, the, the importance of putting in place job-specific tests, that sort of, uh, that awful moment when I suddenly realized I was terrible at hiring people. And then as I sort of read round and was comforted to realize that it turns out no one's any good at hiring, but there are these things you can do to improve your odds. And, and yet so few organizations mm -hmm. do put in those sort of job-specific tests for a board member. Uh, and then the other the other interesting thing that we see is the unwillingness of a lot of board members to go through those tests. And there's, so there's this sort of arrogance of, uh, well, you know, you know what, who I am, what I can do. And then when you do actually get them going through those tests, they perform really badly versus these kind of unknowns who are absolutely brilliant, never sat on a board on their life. And, and the organizations doing that are suddenly tapping in and we're seeing you know, more and more first time board members coming through, you know, the platform as a result of this of people who, who aren't on the radar. They're not the same old names. Um, you know, they're first time board members who are existing execs who are just thinking about the role and they can add real value. And when you put them through that job specific test, it shines out. Um, and, and, and it's interesting also on the on the board level, we often see. You know, in the beginning, we'd have people say, look, I'm not going to apply for a role. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm too big and important. People approach me. And inevitably, you know, what we used to say at the beginning is, well, look, we can let them know you're interested. Um, but uh, and then and then you can have a discussion. And invariably, what would happen when the board saw that and they saw all the other people who'd been willing to go through the process, they'd say, if that person hasn't got the humility and isn't passionate enough about this opportunity to go through this, what are they going to be like on, on our board? And invariably, it doesn't matter who it is, they just get discarded. So Oliver, I'm smiling because I just had this happen last week. And you should, if you were in my house, you would have heard me railing up and down before <laughs> I actually went in for one of these. So with the board for a public organization, not a public organization, a not-for-profit organization here in the UK, but a very public and highly and well-known one. Mm -hmm. and I had to fill in an application, which you know I was encouraged to fill in, and I did it at four o'clock in the morning because I had to finish it. There was a deadline. And so I, fill, I satisfied and I filled it in, four o'clock in the morning, got it in. It's like done. All right, then go to bed. So I'm already upset. <laughs> and then, and I didn't want to do it in the first place. Um, then I was asked to actually make a presentation. I, so I got to the next level. I got to the next stage and I was asked to make a presentation. And I'm like, you want me to make a presentation to you about why I'm good for this board and what value I can add to this board? Didn't I just answer that? Now, this is what bothers me. It's like, didn't I answer that in the um, questions you asked me? This was exactly what the questionnaire was about. What are the specific things that you have done in other board situations? How might you think about this? So re being redundant bothers me. If, you're, if you have me do the work, then do the work and then choose something else for me to do. That, that's, that's, not, that's not helping for me. And it's not using my time wisely. And, and, and the, first, the first thought for me is that this is an organization that wastes time. That has mm. too many evaluators and therefore too many layers of um, bureaucracy that we cannot move quickly. This is so, and this is so antithetical to my world where every decision in venture time has to be made because your runway is burning. But if this is an organization that gets its funding and its funding is basically set forever, and they have a way to get other sorts of things happening, and they have lots and lots of staff, and that staff is responsible for making sure that just certain people don't make it through the system, 
and then you ask me similar questions, I'm beginning to get my impression of what you're like. So sure, it's great to have a system, I agree, and a process, but let's make sure that that process for board members is actually one which is going to give us a new information along the way. That is when we get a really, really good connection. And I think that the process even of interviewing and the process of evaluating and determining who is going to be on the board can be value additive for all parties. That's what I'd like to see. And I don't think, I think many people are using a script that they believe is an interesting script. And the, the script is, feels to me very old school and not very useful. Yeah, I fully agree. I mean, we feel like we're only scratching the surface. I'd love to get us to a point where all boards are doing sort of GMA tests or something like that. So, as you know, basic verbal reasoning, uh, you know, numerical reasoning sort of ability, because actually, again, I, I've sat on boards and I'm sure you've seen this as well, where you just feel like people haven't digested the information they've been prepared or they just don't have a grasp of, of how to handle the numbers. Um, and actually just a basic, basic numerical verbal reasoning test testing someone still cognitively um, there, I think would be very helpful for, for boards um, assessing that. That's what I don't ever think happens because what we end up doing is these are one-on-one -on -one or one, you know, there's a panel of three and then there's one board member and that's all you're doing. Even in that conversation where there's an opportunity for us all to say, well, here's a present example of a problem that we have in the organization. And we'd love to think about sort of this with you. And let's think about, so we have thought about these sorts of ideas. What would you think in terms of these ideas? Are there other things that you might add? That would be an approach that would show, again, because most of the time it's not going to be spent in quiet isolation and then, you know, filling out a, a, a worksheet and then turning it in and getting an A or a D on it because you got the answer right. Most of your time is going to be spent in conversation with other people, trying to come up with a consensus view and an aligned approach, which is going to accelerate. That never happens. So if you can find an organization that has figured out a way to do this and to help us to, to do what most of all happens during the evaluation process and afterward as we get on the board, that then I think is is transformative. Definitely. Actually, it was a really interesting piece from Adam Grant, who's um, one of my favorite sort of authors, uh, mm -hmm. who what, he was talking about an organization where they would basically, they'd bring the candidates in and then rotate them around four different tables uh, mm -hmm. on a specific task like that. And then they would look at how the effect of each candidate on bringing the best out of different people around the table, exactly that. Or And, and I think, you know, you could really imagine boards doing that. One thing we, we, we have seen sort of boards on the platform doing, which mm -hmm. I think goes some way to that is going and doing site site tours with wow. the sort of five shortlisted candidates right mm -hmm. sort of walking walking the floors and just through that discussion even though they know they're all in sort of competition uh, to some degree seeing how do people interact in that environment what's the value they are just walking around how do they bounce off other people uh, so i think again it feels like boards are so far behind versus sort of executive hiring in the way that they assess them well, it's um, an area we're, we're spending lots of time thinking about um I, I just want to go back i mean again like the way you think about things seems so refreshing um as a board member versus a lot of investor directors i hear from so many founders who say you know their their investor directors are basically out there to prove them wrong show you know how smart they are um you know wh wh what do you see i mean you must see a, a bit of this with sort of other investor directors um on boards that you sit in and that investor director versus independent director dynamic um you know i will often sort of champion the value of an independent director uh, alongside investor direct i think they both bring value but how, how do you think about that so i've been on the receiving end so much having been in the c-suite and generally the chief operating officer so i'm the person who prepares all the board materials i'm the one who deals with all the resolutions i'm the one who has to who puts together all the um all of the um decks that are going to then be used to support um, decision making in small as well as very large companies and particularly scaling companies all there is is are mistakes right all that's all we do as and we're trying to minimize the number of mistakes that we're making as operating execs we make one good decision a day and then you know nine okay decisions and one horrible decision on a daily basis so i, I get i get that and the and directors however who come in with the idea to make sure that we understand how stupid you know you as an operating exec are i, I find that very very difficult and you begin to see that you actually all of the activity of board becomes around making sure you don't get criticized, that you are not called out in those meetings. And it becomes very, very narrow in terms of focus. I blame many times the, um, and in my kind of organizations, you sometimes don't have a choice because people who put in a certain amount of money get a certain percentage of the company, have an, own a certain percentage of the company, get to be board members. And you don't get to choose who that board member is. We figured out methods to then switch some people over time, but you might you know, have to deal with someone who you'd rather not 
um, at the very beginning. Board members who, where the entire thing is like a contest, it's a competition of who's the smartest, who has read the most recent article, who had a more interesting conversation in another blockchain company that is that's in their portfolio, who has you know been to um, Paris and had a conversation with somebody about the future of you know synthetic fibers, you know, and bringing that to the conversation is sometimes they're constructive, but often they are to make sure that everyone understands how how good we are or how smart we are. I, and I say when I say I blame someone, I blame the chair of the board. Um, because she or he is an individual who allows those sorts of things to happen and sort of sets the tone and is the person who should ahead of time, along with the executive team, decide what is the kind of input that you're looking for, constructing a conversation as well as constructing a board that makes sense for moving things forward and progressing things. And if indeed what we're finding is we're focusing on narrower and narrower things because the team is so scared that they're going to be criticized and they're going to be called out, that indeed they work very specifically to um, increase the um, aperture. And in terms of increasing the aperture, whether that happens through strategy days, whether that happens through you know, working groups or however it needs to happen, I work with chairs of boards to make sure that that actually happens. And some of the best boards that I have, either on which I've served or that have served um, the companies that I've run as um, an, ex uh, you know, an operating exec, those are those, that's my chief ally. You know, that chairwoman is my chief ally who can help to do that. My investment portfolio for ImpactX, the venture capital fund that I run, we invest in digital technology, health education, lifestyle, and media and entertainment in the UK and Europe. And we focus on underrepresented entrepreneurs exclusively. So these are individuals who generally find themselves in many rooms, what the same way that people, that these founders find themselves, that people are saying are, are really critical. And the, the idea being that you are not likely to have, you're no Jeff Bezos. There could never be a woman, a black woman from Bristol who is the Jeff Bezos, who is unassailable in terms of his intellect. There's no one who could be an Indian man from um, Manchester who could be Tim Cook. It's just impossible because our the view of many investors is that's just impossible. And so there's always this, ten, there's sometimes an inherent tension which happens or there's the paternalism that happens that we need to really help you because you can't be as confident, but we're going to help you out. So there's the negative, and then there's the negative, which is which is mass and positive. All of those are things that I, that we end up dealing with. And so for me, I'm very acutely aware, also as a black as a black man, that those are some of the assumptions that come into the room and we have to contend with, um, and that if we're going to contend with them, let's be very deliberate in our approach to doing that. And so um, I work with my uh, portfolio companies and my team works with our portfolio companies to make sure that they're prepared. And then we work very hard to make sure that around the table, we have the right sort of people to help them to get where they need to be. We don't just, you know, we'll look at all the things that other people will look at, competencies and the like. But if we feel as though a person's not going to be, look, and has a proven track record of being able to show that they work effectively with certain people, and you say, look, you've never run an organization where there's been a senior black person or a senior woman in your management team you've never worked on a board where there are anything other than white men on it. I don't know why you think you'd be good on this. It's interesting. I mean, the whole question of diversity is obviously like super relevant for boards at the moment. And, and we see lots of the organizations on, um, you know, using the platform, looking to improve the diversity of their boards. And you get the sort of less good ones where they're sort of ticking the box and they're sort of to tokenistic in their approach um, in, in whatever that what, where that might be. And then there are others who, you know, the best practice is where they're sort of looking for, you know, the best person and someone who will contribute to the, the diversity of thinking around their board. But we'll often hear from people that they're just, there aren't enough good people out there of from sort of diverse backgrounds um, and, you know, talking in protected characteristic sense, whether that's gender or ethnicity, um, age, um, whatever else it might be. And there's an I interesting phenomenon, I think, in the UK, where there's this m massive demographic wave, which it seems to me surprisingly few people are aware of, that if you look at the certainly sort of 2011 census data, something like 25% of that age group are, uh, are ethnic minority uh, versus the sort of 50 to 55 age group where it's sort of 5%. And so you've got this kind of interesting dynamic where those with experience, you know, the typical board age are, are, are kind of 
there, there, there's a lower proportion relative to your sort of future customer stakeholders. And that was back in 2011. So that picture has shifted even more. Uh, I think the hump back then was at sort of 30s, 40s. So that's even even started to shift shift a lot more. But what we see from boards often is they'll say, well, we're looking to improve the diversity. Um, and then you and then they'll find all these candidates through the platform who are diverse candidates. And they'll, they'll go, ooh, they're, they're not like us. And they're sort of fall, fall, fallen victim to this sort of homophily where, you know, people want to be working with people like them. How, what was clear to me, again, watching you on Moneymaker was that you had found some unbelievably talented individuals um, from underrepresented mm-hmm. sort of backgrounds. Uh, and yet, you, you know, you yourself come from an incredibly sort of, you know, your Ivy League educated, uh, privileged sort of background in that regard. H- how do you like guard against your own sort of biases how do you how do you think about that when you're looking at sort of young entrepreneurs who've who who've not been through you know the successes that you've been through you've worked in you know top blue chip organizations you you sort of now you know you look at the impact os uh, impact x board and it's mm-hmm. like the great i mean amazing people you're working with amazing proven people the whole time and suddenly you're coming and looking at these you know first time entrepreneurs a lot of them or early stage can you talk me through the kind of the, the mental models again that maybe you use to do that let me start off with the first part of the question i believe that people are being extremely very lazy in terms of their sourcing and when i say this sourcing i have thought and this is yeah. this is me i have thought that everyone grew up with lebron james as someone that they would see everyone grew up knowing about um Oprah Winfrey. Everyone grew up knowing that there was a thing called BET that was started by a black person. Mm. Everyone grew up knowing Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. It's just impossible that based on that, that there could be in your mind, and quite frankly, I, I'm surprised that there could be given sort of what the demographics are in a city, especially like London or um, Birmingham, where most investment happens. It's not like most investment is happening in Scotland. What's happening in London where it's 50-50. So you know, that's where people are spending their time. Mm. They've been educated around and other sorts of things. So it's it's curious to me that um, if indeed we see a world in which all these individuals sort of exist out there as business and other sort of professionals, and, you know, at one point the most powerful person in the world is a black man, that we actually don't believe that there are other people and that are, but what we do, what we do know is that our own laziness has not opened us to any of these networks. I don't want to spend the time sort of going to the places and the events where these other people exist and learning about them. I want to continue to be with my old Etonians. I still want to be at Annabelle's. I want to be at the golf club, the Sunnyvale, Sunnydale, whatever it's called. Those are the places where I want to spend my time. And if I don't see people of color there and I'm Mm. building my relationships in those locations, those locations, that's where I will say I'm finding the most effective um, solution, the most effective solution set, i.e. that's my pipeline for future people. That's lazy. That, that has nothing to do with what the world is. That's what mm-hmm. you're doing in the world. I don't blame it on the, I, I don't blame the victim. It's like I blame the person who doesn't do their work. And I don't believe you outsource that work to somebody else. It's not your job as a board person to then outsource that to a search firm and say, search firm, I haven't been able to spend any of my time expanding my vision of the world and sort of meeting other sorts of people, but you should, and you should bring it to me. And then at the same time that we're, we're getting critical positions filled, I want you to then deal with all the things that I'm dealing with, all the views that I have of the world, all the biases. I want you to deal with that at the same time. And this is a secondary function for me. And I have five other boards that I'm on. How can you do that and actually come up with something that makes sense? The number of times that I go to a meeting and I always, and people send me to see chair of the boards all the time and the chair of boards, they love to see me and so they start talking to me. And then when they start talking to me and they see that I, that I think a little differently, you know, because they see Harvard law school, they see, you know, a uh, appointee of Barack Obama. They see that um, I was, I went to Princeton university. The assumption is that we think the same and that, and, and, and for me, it would be a privilege to have a conversation and to serve on these spaces. But what they hear is, unless you have momentum, unless you have other people of color, unless you've already dealt with some of these issues, I'm not the person to help you to get to, to start the ball rolling. I need the ball to be rolling. You have some goals. You have some process. You have some approach. Once you've done that, then we can have a conversation and I will open my network to you. The number of people that also ask me, Eric, can you just give us some names for people that would be ideal for this particular for this particular role? And I say, no, I'll give you an organization that you can meet 
and then you can spend some time figuring out how you want to partner with this organization in order to find people to, to satisfy not just this need, but needs throughout your organization. But I'm not giving you names. It just is not worth your time or my time. So mm. you round out your, your slate of potential candidates. And I think that that's one of the big fallacies. And I think it's very lazy. If we can figure out how to get people for a pleasure cruise into, into low space altitude, you know, and then come back down, and, and so mm-hmm. we can figure out how to find a slate of people. Then in terms of my, in terms of me and ter- in my um, approach to looking at the ways in which my existence has allowed me a type of privilege, and then that privilege influences how I look at things. At Impact X, we are looking at organizations that have product market fit. We do not invest in people who have an idea on a piece of paper and then try and decide who among these makes sense. We look Mm -hmm. at what you have achieved. We try and use transparent systems that are data and fact oriented as opposed to, you hear lots of organizations talking about, I have to have deep conviction about the management team and that sort of thing. We need to see the execution heft. So what we try and do, and this is why I always recommend for people of color and women, go into parts of organizations where there is objective criteria, where there are objective criteria to judging you as opposed to subjective. It's like, not only do you, we know you know how to use the right, the right fork. We know that you know how not to, you know, burp in the elevator. We know that you've got all of that. We know that you've had the education and all those types of things. Go to places where your merit is based on what it is that you're doing. The assumption about you is based on sort of what you do. Subjective standards. I think you constantly end up dealing with other people's isms, uh, and uh, and that is going to be a problem that is going to then haunt you and limit your opportunities in career. I think that is one of the, the key issues for for many of these boards is that they uh, they are sort of too divorced from, uh, you know, I, I was at a, a round table the other day where some search firms were patting themselves on the back for having hired some people of color. And they said, they are out there, you've just got to look for them. And I was sort of sitting there thinking, what? Like half half of the London population uh, is like, where where are they fishing? I like the way you put that, Oliver. People congratulate themselves on creating a 50%. We have to have 50% of women who are in our screening process. And we have to have so many percent that are people of color who are in our screening process for board. And yet none of them make it through because at some point, you know what happens? We have this collegiality conversation or we have a conversation about we don't know them. We can't vouch for them. And therefore, no matter how good everything is, if they're not sort of already known and they're like, and there are 10 people who are known, right? There's Rick Lewis who is known, there's Ursula Burns who is known, there's Vivian Hunt that is known, there's Kim Lisa who is known. Unless they're one of those names, it's like there could not be Daoud is known, Henry Obi is known. They're, those people, anyone else is not going to be inter- sufficiently interesting. And you sort of look around the board table and you say, now, when I look at these other people who are on the board, do they have the same the, the credentials as the ones that we have to always choose. I have these conversations all the time. And, and again, I get a little tired of it. So I work where, I work into where the doors are, are leaning open. And I'm not interested in fighting against organizations that have another view. But I, I feel as though, just like the mammoth and the dinosaur, those organizations will, um, will not survive because they just don't have an appropriate view that's sort of forward-looking. And I think that the, they are sowing their own there's their own yeah. extinction and their own marginality. So. No, I mean, we, we have a sort of similar experience. There's some, you, you can really see it in the boards that use new role or the ones that are forward looking in our experience. And there are some people who just don't get it and they don't understand why they shouldn't go tap the shoulder of the person that they're at the golf club with or, or whatever else it might be. And this idea of sort of casting the net wider is like, well, why would I bother doing that? I know lots of good people. Um, and, and, you know, we've taken that sort of adoption curve thing, which is you push on the open doors and, and they will soon have to follow. And, and often actually it was interesting at the beginning, we'd have lots of people who'd say, I don't want to be signed up. I get approached. And now they, they sort of come come back and say, oh, can I sign up to your list, please? Um, uh, quite interesting opportunity. I'd like to be part of that, which is uh, nice to see. Um, and we, 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 see, we, we say yes, because, um, you know, it should be about, you know, inc- inclusivity. One of the things I find very frustrating about a lot of the um, uh, conversation at the moment is how, like, alienating it is and and again that's one thing i loved about um money is how it was a real positive vibe to it it wasn't about making people feel small it wasn't about you know what they couldn't do it's about what you could do and and i feel like a lot of those conversations you have different tribes that are basically you know putting other you know the tribes that they're not part of down um and whatever whatever way that you're sort of defined and, mm-hmm. and i feel like people need to 
work much more positively together and, and inclusively. Eric, I, I could keep talking to you for for ages, but I, I'm conscious I've got to, got to wrap up. So I'd love to wrap up with a five question quick fire if, if that's okay. So one book that every board member should read. The quintessential board member is Ursula Burns, who has been on the board of Uber, Exxon, the Ford Foundation, MIT, and American Express. Read her book, Where You Are Is Not Who You Are. Ursula Burns, Where You Are Is Not Who You Are. Your favorite quote? I come from a family of, you know, we're a religious family, grew up with religion all the time. And my father's favorite quote was, and I think he got this after he came out of, uh, out of um, the military, it was, if you want your prayers answered, get off your knees and hustle. Love it. Your favorite place to eat? I, am, I have the luxury of being um, married to someone who uh, put himself through school as a chef. So Shay Eric is exactly where I like to eat. Amazing. Your favorite holiday? Uh, the Collins family has been meeting uh, as a um, reunion every year for the last 70 years straight. So my favorite holiday is the Collins annual family reunion. And, and lastly, your favorite app? My favorite app is and will always be YouTube. I think that it is miraculous what I can see from you know, old pictures of 1900 London that have been digitally enhanced to make them much more seeable, all the way through to some of the greatest moments in sports and or political history, all sitting there for free. I think it is miraculous. Fantastic. Eric, it has been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, and I'm sure that our new rollers will love hearing this. Thanks, Oliver. It's been great. Sensational questions. And I look forward to talking to you again sometime.